The other thing I love is like the ambassadors for Tudor. Could you imagine them being at Rolex? No <laughs> shot. Yeah. No, no shot. shot. I, I would have seen Beckham Rag with all the tattoos. Yeah, and everything. Beckham's like, all tatted out and, you know, Lady Gaga. It's the kind of younger, <laughs> hipper yeah. brand. Yeah. But, like, you know, you think about it. Imagine those meetings at, you know, at Fifth Avenue at Rolex that are, you know, if you're not playing golf or tennis or a violinist, yeah. you know, you're not in the building. I, I mean, it's I, a totally different. They totally field. break that mold. I also wonder like how much of the identity comes from the product and how much comes from marketing. Yeah. Because like there's so much marketing in the watch game these days sure. and you know you got stars who are behind yeah, it and ambassadors but like I look names. at it more like <laughs> what is the product that's really behind it and you know yeah. what's the identity of that product. I, I think Tudor is a great example because Tudor in the past well, 10, 12 years have gone through so, so much. Cause I think 12 years ago, you couldn't buy a Tudor in the US. Couldn't maybe, buy them in the States. Right, you couldn't buy them in the States. I'm gonna just watch it. Right. Like, a lot of people heard about it. If you're into watches, somebody had one on, oh, how did you get this Tudor? And then when they came into the United States, it was, we're finally here. So everybody's running and getting on. It was a comeback, man. You, you Cause know? I remembered when I was a kid, Tudor was right alongside Rolex. And then nobody would, it was terrible to sell in the States. And then they pulled it and came back in. Yeah. And it was only, it was a back and forth. It was like on and off love affair with the States. Do you think they it was kind only of, available in Europe? They kind of reinvent themselves over that time? Totally period? did. I mean, back originally, they were just a poor man's Rolex. Right. Mm -hmm. right and, right, right. you know, you didn't want to spend, you know, $1,800 for a, a steel and gold Rolex and it was $900 for a Tudor. Sure. You know, yeah. and then when they went just to Europe, they started coming out with these cool chronos and vintage pieces, and the brand became an identity. Sure. And like, we were getting people who were traveling over and bringing yep. them back, we're like, oh, these are kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. And it be, the product developed the identity that was then, again, separate from Rolex. Yeah, and now today, you know, something like this bronze piece here, totally different. Maybe it looks a little bit but like a Rolex, but it's its own identity, its own piece. Um, and I think they have done a very good job of going after somebody who's a little bit younger while still Given that vintage vibe, that vintage character, or somebody who's looking, you know, for, for like a, you know, you find like an old uh, Tudor um, snowflake or something out there, yeah. you still get that feeling in there. Well, I think there's a there's there's something that vintage has kind of like made its way back to the forefront. Um, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, I know vintage market is strong right now for Rolex. Crazy strong for Rolex. Um, and and I, I think that there's there's a certain appeal to it that's there now that might not necessarily have been there a couple of years ago. Um, and and you know, they've hit it on the head. Um, but when you think of personality and watches and brand identity, Elise Norden is a brand that really speaks out to me because it, it kind of has stuck to its own lane for so long. It's done its own thing. It has, in my opinion, done the best job of playing at both spectrums of the price range, a great $6,000 watch or a great million dollar automaton with Genghis Khan riding around with the rubies and everything. And they'll give you something in between like this um, manufactured marine uh, chronometer, which is still paying tribute to the origins of Ulysses Nardin, which is marine chronometers you'd have on sail ships. So it's a brand that like when we um, talked about brand identity, something that really popped into me because uh, popped in my head because they keep that design element, but they still always have the R&D, always great. See, movement. I always thought of UN as their watchmaking because, you know, be it the Freak, yes. be it the Genghis Khan, be it these really crazy um, kind of cutting edge technology yeah, have not been from the watchmakers <laughs> that, you know, nobody really, unless you were really cool into watches, really paid that much attention to it. It wasn't like a mass brand. I don't know if it'll ever be but I think it's got a, definitely got a, an interesting identity for yeah, sure. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I don't know if it'll ever be this mass brand. I think, you know, in certain parts of Europe, I know Russia for a time, it was very, very huge over there, but it's always that brand that many people know of, but it's still a few layers under like the big mainstream. But um, but again, it, it, it's never made a watch that look like a Nautilus, right? No. It's never made a watch that look like a Royal they Oak. Use, they use cool materials too. Exactly. Yeah, they they had, get real creative. Yeah, like no, they the were freak. very early on being cutting edge. Yeah. And they were also, I looked at them as kind of like, they were watchmakers, but never promoted the watchmakers out in the forefront like today. True. Like today, everybody talks about the watchmakers, you know, the brands. There's a lot of names on the dials. I think Jorn set that up for mm -hmm. us. Um, but UN had 
spectacular cutting edge watchmakers, but never yes. pushed that as their brand. Yeah, I, I think um, if, if I'm correct, um, the lady who made the, the Freak, she went over to, who helped develop the Freak, she went over to Cartier and she's still over there doing big things. Yep. So you're right, many big um, big names in watch making. Um, F.P. Jordan did a, some work for UN in the past as well. So it has been a great house where people have come, been able to add their artistry. But again, the, the, the personality, the brand identity has always been over, been able to, uh, to shine through at UN. I don't know, it's, it's one of my favorite brands out there. That's a good looking watch too. Yeah. It is a great brand. If you're trying to, trying to be not different, as good looking as my yeah. watches I picked. Yeah, no, you, you, you know you me, know. I always go longer. Yeah, you, <laughs> and honestly, uh, it is really because of brand identity and they are probably, in my humble opinion, the, the worst marketed brand ever. Because like, <laughs> yeah. they just don't do a great job of marketing, you know, but the identity of the brand, and when you get to go there, and if you can ever get there, I tell anybody, and they welcome people to go. The environment and the culture there is like nothing you've ever seen. And all they care about is making watches and movements. And none of the cases are crazy. They don't do, you know, wacky materials. They just basically make movements. And in a very short time, 25 years, have made spectacular movements. I mean, we have the Lumen here, which is incredible. Um, again, materials, but still very classic, looks like a longa. But the best part of a longa is always the backside. Oh, and sure. I think the identity of that brand is the fact that they've got all these people sitting over there. And the last time I was there, I think they had 86 finishers. And they literally sit side by side on a table, you know, polishing a part for like hours on end. And every single part, front and back, is done that way. And I don't know how they do it, making money doing it, but it's just incredible. And then they do things like the Zeit work and the striking times. And I think that identity and the culture, and as soon as you show any interest in what they're doing over there, you'll be there for hours. I mean, sure. they'll just talk your ear off. They'll show you what they're doing, the hand engraving department. It's like, I've been to a lot of factories. To me, there's no place that gets me more excited than going to Long. And talk about a brand where the, the identity kind of went away, right? It kind of almost, it did. They're out of business. It, it, it did for, went away. You know, and maybe some design elements were here or there. But um, uh, it walked along, they didn't, you know, when the walls came down, try to bring the brand up. And still, the brand itself had to kind of find that identity again, right? Well, they created an identity at a time when it was basically Paddock and Rolex. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, there was AP and yeah, there was Vacheron. But like, nobody came out and made a watch that was more expensive than Paddock. And they did. And yeah. they said, we're going to raise the standards of finishing to a higher level than Paddock's doing and we're in the middle of nowhere germany and everybody was kind of like what you know who's gonna spend that money for a german watch who's gonna you know it's kind of off center what is that i mean there was so many odd things that were a little eccentric but still made a classic watch um so that identity of like you could sell it to somebody who's still traditional and classic but was like eh, this is a little different than you know, everybody else who's got a paddock. Yeah, they, they were going to dig a little bit. And you're right, that's such a great, um, it was like a shot across the bow of paddock, right? Because traditionally they are the highest mainstream. It was all everybody. I mean, when I was you know, a kid growing up, that's all they told, you know, best watch in the world, paddock for right? Exactly. No question about it. So to come in that aggressive and go for like that price point and, and do what, what Long has been able to do at a time where it really was a holy trinity. It was AP Vacheron paddock and paddock AP Vacheron is either way, somewhere like that. But uh, for a brand to come out of there and still, to this day, be one of those brands where... Yeah, we still talk about the Datagraph. Yeah. I mean, know? they made that when they were German a little tiny to, company. Yes. They're undoubt like, when you look at a Langa, you know it's a Langa. Even, like, it, it's, it's unquestionable. They're, they're, it's, they, they have a way of capturing the, you know, the German spirit. Yes. Well, I was going to say, I, I always recreate it to a German car. Yes, It's like, exactly. you close the door, it feels a little See, different, it's, it's a little heavier. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, it's not delicate by no. any means. It no. never tried to They're be pretty. Too. Yeah, yeah. A lot of, I mean, that's, it was, that's so different from Paddock, right? You come to expect a, a very elegant, you know, low profile watch, but they, they break the mold there too because. I mean, they're big watches, but, you know, with good reason, too, because there's so much packed into them. There's so much packed into them. And I'm just I have that soft spot that, you know, it's my thing. I love it. But to me, that is a great sign of a brand identity is passion can be transferred. Right. Because I think the only reason why uh, Blanc is, is still going and even on the pre-owned side, we see the steam it has is because 
of the collectors and people like you who are enthusiasts of the brand and really just, they don't mind taking up the marketing side that long and maybe isn't the best. At. <laughs> you know, maybe they aren't the best, but the one thing that they do have- Can't you give me like one good tagline? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, you know, like one, just one good line that I could it. sell. <laughs> Nothing. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, it's kind of a, a good way to segue into another brand that's kind of similar. Um, you know, FP Jorn, I, I can't say enough good things about this brand. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, for, for when we talk brand identity, um, Jorn has completely its own identity. Like you can't, you can't really compare it to any other brand. Um, you know, with, with, you know, the amount that they output every year being so small and, and, you know, Mr. Jorn's touch on every single detail that goes into them, you know, it is through and through completely unique. Um, so, you know, uh, it's hard to say, you know, who exactly it appeals to because, you know, it, I think it, it touches everybody and every watch collector, you know, they, they might not know about it at first, but as they progress through collecting, you know, you start to hear more and more about Jorn and, 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 you know, you, you see the, the attention to detail that him and his team put into these and you're like, you know, add that alongside the Patek or the Langa for that for that little extra flair of uniqueness, you know, yeah. compared to the rest. I mean, I, I just, I think they're so special and, you know, what the brand's doing right now is unprecedented, which is really cool to see too. Yeah, no, they, they're on fire, but you know, it is interesting because not everybody loves F.P. Jorn, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, Mr. Jorn is Mr. Jorn, you know, and he is him <laughs> and there is no, He's walking his path right. and I, I don't- He's not about to change the, for anybody. Yeah, yeah, you know, I don't think there's nothing you could do um, that would make him change his design. And and uh, interesting enough, he's, he is the only live-in watchmaker that we're talking about today. So it's nice to actually be able to see that. Somebody who is there in modern time, in watchmaking, making his type of watches right. his way. But again, not buckling to anything. I, I, you know, you're not gonna see a watch that looks like any other watch come out of FP I don't think there's a amount of money that would make him do something he doesn't want to do. Maybe you'll get a dollar. Oh no, he does what know? he wants to do. It, exactly. And he's always yeah. been that way. And I mean- You have to love that about it. And yeah. you know, like that, that right there, you know, identity is exclusively his. And yes. it's not about the change. It doesn't matter. No one is going to influence what he releases. He does it how he wants to do it. And I think that's what's generated such a love for the brand is because you know, he does it his way. He doesn't care about. Well, the identity is definitely it. him. It's I it. mean, it's, it's not yeah, a, exactly. you know, created. Yeah, no ambassador. No there. ambassador <laughs> no, there. No, Believe no, me, he, he is, is the his ambassador. Own ambassador. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and he's not very good at it. Let's yeah. be honest. I mean, I remember. <laughs> he doesn't care. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't care. I remember, I started selling Jorn in the early two thousands, and you know, took a couple of years to get the franchise, and then you would go once a year, you know, to go to Geneva to go. To and you would see him for maybe five minutes. And literally, it just felt like it was painful for him. <laughs> because <laughs> like, he just wanted to be at the bench fixing his watches, and you were basically there bothering him. Mm -hmm. And yes, I know he realized that, you know, these are my customers and I gotta go spend some time with it, but I really don't want it. <laughs> I wanna go make watches. You know, I got this one, I gotta finish. It's just, exactly. you really this felt like in time. time. <laughs> Thank God Pierre was there, because yes. he would spend hours with us, but you got like five or 10 minutes with Mr. Jordan. And you have to say that's that why collectors love him. I mean, because yeah. it gives him, it, it just, it, it's so different from everybody else putting on a big smile, you know, happy to see everyone. He's oh, just no. like, no, no, I wanna get down to business. Like, uh, and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, Thanks I, for my watch. No. But the guy was just happiest at the bench. And I mean, again, it's truly a watchmaker's thing. And uh, I, my dad was a watchmaker and, you know, they're not easy. No. And they're just, they're all, they're wired a little different. And to, to do what they do at this level, they're all a little, you know, it, it's, it, it's surgery. <laughs> it's, it's, it's surgery. Yeah. It's, yeah, there's Every a certain amount of arrogance. There's a certain amount yeah. of attention to detail. You know, they believe they can do anything. Yeah, and that true. environment, it's its a very interesting dynamic that you get. They're absolutely from a, surgeons. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Yeah. Same it, kind of thing. They have to be. Exactly. There's no, there's no way you, you, you go into that profession without that special touch. Yeah. Or even you, you, screw loose, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I believe that. I really do. I mean, you have to have that incredible focus and that belief like you can do anything. Exactly. And that's that same kind of thing. I think that's a great analogy. Yeah. So, and, and, and you yeah. do have to have that steady hand as well, right? With, <laughs> That's right. You, know, you got hope. everything else, but like, you know, there's just many who go to the test and like the steady hand is the touch. I had to go with Jorn for that exact reason. I mean, I, I, I love those brands. And you do pick a, a beautiful one, actually. I yeah, the QP. Yeah, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, Samandal QP. Yeah. Uh, I bought do... a platinum 
Salmon Dial QP today. Oh. I've never seen one before. I've they're, never seen they're, that they're either. It's rare. gorgeous. Yeah. And they do it's one of the best gorgeous. salmons out there. Yeah. You know, it, it, nice but on the platinum, pink. I like it even better. It breaks oh, it, it, it makes it pop that yeah. much more. It's exactly. like a 5270. Yeah, I thought George was going to have an accident. He was so excited. Oh, yeah, no, I, <laughs> no, I, I, I want to I run down and see it now. Um, it's gorgeous. <laughs> Another piece that, um, another brand I should say that popped into my head when I thought brand identity was uh, Louis Monet. Um, and if you don't know about Louis Monet, it's a very interesting brand. But in a nutshell, Louis Monet himself was a French urologist and he actually made the first chronograph back in 1816, which is over 100 years before, you know, the whole other projects and the, the next other chronograph was, um, announced, which is insane. Not only did he make the first chronograph, it ran at over 200,000 vibrations an hour. So it was 10 times faster than, you know, what's considered a very accurate watch today. Um, and I thought that was so interesting. Now, of course, you know, Mr. Monet is long gone and the brand is under new ownership t today. But what they do has been amazing for me to see. All the pieces that they've been releasing have really kind of pushed forward that identity, including this chronograph here, which is just showing you the beautiful chronograph face. Very nice, substantial watches. You know, they know the challenge of being a little bit newer in the industry, but they're really paying attention to the identity of what Mr. Uh, Monet had in mind. And I kind of like that. I'm excited to see where they go. So they're just a brand that kind of popped in my head. They're doing like amazing things right now. I love these kind of whether you call them boutique brands or, I mean, they call them independents, but there's certainly different levels, but these really boutique brands that have the ability now to do things that are super special on small scales. Yes. And they can afford to do it where before, you know, you go back 20, 30 years ago, these guys couldn't distribute and they couldn't sell their product. And now, you know, with the internet, with social media, with all this around, it's much easier to get known and get out there without spending a fortune and they can really focus on making product that's crazy and you know at a level that you can afford to do it i think that's such a great point but i think um a part of brand identity you're going to see in the next 10 years going forward is all these new brands that are able to support themselves you know somebody much smaller than louise Monet. you know when i was in dubai a collector bought a um a meteorite case um really cool watch that was handmade by um uh, a watchmaker in austria and found him on Instagram, and the watch probably cost eight or 10,000, but he was able to get every little detail he wanted. And I think there'll be so much brands like that, like Recepi and Roger Smith, that you know we don't even know their names today, but because of social media and because of how open the world yeah. is today, they'll be able to- The word's know, getting out. Yeah, yeah you know. the world's getting out. Well, Grunfeld, I mean, look and at the- They don't have to do too they're much They're making 75, themselves. 80 watches a year, and you know, they're the fans two brothers are, and they're- you know? I don't think you can, they're pretty much sold out. You they're sold out, you, know? you can't get one. And, yeah. and, but that, that's such an exciting time, because before, and I was thinking, you know, how did somebody find a new watch? Like when you first started in the industry, there was no- You internet. went to Basel. Yeah. You, you went know? to Basel, you wandered around the back of the building. But, but I mean, like, literally like the big brands were up front and then you'd go spend a day wandering around the back. And but, I but remember meeting a, Frank Mueller when he was, you know, had a little showcase in the back that with his five watches that didn't work. Uh, that were so awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> if they no, I'm serious. <laughs> like he would build these wacky turbines and like, like I mean, that's he, how he started. The most complicated was watch ever, print. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that was his stuff. thing. I mean, it was true. You, you you had to know a guy like Mike Mandel to really be introduced or a good. Well, that's what that's what the job was. Into, a lot uh, of it was right. You would Pushing connect them. to the clients, and you would have to go find the stuff and bring it to the clients. Now the clients are calling us and saying, you know, what do you think yeah. of this? What's that brand like? What is the identity of that Which brand? Which is great. You're right. Because that frees them up to, to you know, put their own flair on their watches and focus more exclusively on the product they're putting out rather than well, trying to market it. Well, more importantly, it makes our job easier. That's right. <laughs> so it makes our job a whole lot easier. <laughs>